I would say that people in Iran have two different lives. One life is outside in public and at homes they have a private life. They live however they like. Everyone, um, boys and girls, are forced to follow Islamic rules. Some things that I remember about my childhood at school was that before going to classes, we had to stand in lines and say things like, dead to America, dead to Israel. We had a difficult times in prison because we were both sick, we were suffering. And as soon as they would hear that we were Christians, they would refuse to give us medication. The suffering that we experience in prison compared to the sufferings that Jesus did for us, it's nothing. Today on the podcast, I sit down with Miriam and Marzia, two women who are imprisoned for their faith in Iran. And we discuss their journey of converting to Christianity in a very unlikely way, uh, to their ministry of passing out Bibles in the streets of Tehran, to their imprisonment uh, in one of the worst prisons in the world. Um, these women are courageous. These women are radical. And I can't wait for you to hear their story. Well, you guys, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Uh, Miriam and Marzia, um, last night I was able to hear a little bit of your story at an event, and I was just blown away uh, by your courage, um, by your story of God's protection and redemption, and, and how he's used you in an unbelievable circumstance. And um, I want to start by asking you, because um, you're both from Iran, and it's a place that here in the United States that we don't really understand well because um, politically they've been an enemy of ours, um, so it's often based around fear. Um, and the pictures that we have uh, of Iran are, um, I think, are very manipulated by probably both governments. And you know, when I when I researched uh, before the Islamic Revolution. I saw photos of Iran and it looked like Southern California. The women are dressed, you know, like how you're dressed today. And um, it, it, was, it looks very different from the perception that we have. And so I want to ask you, what was your experience culturally growing up in Iran? And what are the things that you loved about the place in which you grew up? You know, as you mentioned, um, it was very different before the revolution. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have much experience. Um, and Because uh, we, we you're too young. Yes, we, we, <laughs> not too young, but we heard from our parents, our grandparents, how great Iran was before uh, the Islamic Revolution. People Which was in 1979. Freedom. Yes, the Islamic Revolution happened in 1979. But before that, uh, people had freedom, especially women had freedom. And um, the, I mean, other religions, um, like Christians, they all could live uh, together in peace. Uh, there was no religious persecution. And it was, very, it was a different era, different time. Um, I was born after the revolution, and unfortunately, all we experienced was you know, uh, living in an Islamic country under the Islamic rules. Um, and I remember from a very young age, we learned you know, the, the harsh uh, rules of Islam, and we were under suppression, especially women in Iran. Um, you know, like uh, girls, uh, when they reach the age of nine years old, um, they have to cover their hair, they have to wear hijab, and they are forced, everyone, um, boys and girls, are forced to follow Islamic rules. Uh, it starts at very young age at the schools. They have to read the Quran in Arabic. It's not our uh, original language. We speak Farsi and we don't know Arabic, but we were forced at the schools to read Arabic, to read about um, Islam and learn about Islamic rules, to practice uh, namaz, pray namaz at the school. Um, and it's, if you don't follow these Islamic rules, um, you will face punishment. Um, uh, they, would, uh, they can ban you from going to school. And everyone had to follow these rules. Um, and I, something else that I remember about my childhood at school was that before going to classes, uh, we had to stand in lines and say things like, dead to America, dead to Israel. You know, at that young age, we had no idea where America was, where Israel was. But we were forced to repeat these things before going to our classrooms. They try to uh, brainwash people from very young age. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, just the only thing that, that we had access to, the only re religion, was Islam. We had to follow those Islamic rules. And it was, um, I can say, growing up in, under that condition, uh, it was so hard for us because everything was forced to us. We, we did not have the freedom to choose. 
like um, when it comes to religion or other choices in life, everything is forced on people. They, they don't have the option to choose how to live. And I would say that people in Iran have two different lives. One life is outside in public. They have to pretend they are someone else. And at homes, they have a private life. They live however they like. So there's, it creates a kind of a contradiction. And you, it's like you, you are living two different lives. Wow. So may I add some? Yeah, um, please. Um, as Maya mentioned, we don't have much experience uh, before the revolution. Uh, but I remember um, from my parents, they shared with me during the Shah, uh, there was freedom. Uh, women uh, had a lot of rights. And they shared with me that one of uh, their neighbors uh, was American. And they were so friendly. And uh, my mom shared with me that uh, when I was born, uh, they uh, gave uh, my mom a gift. Uh, they knitted uh, socks for me. And they were so kind to them, and they had very good relationship. At that time, Iran had a good relationship with the United States, with Israel. Uh, but unfortunately, after the revolution, everything changed. And mm. it's been over 40 years that um, the country and Iranian people are captured by this government. And as Mariam shared, um, the most the, the most pressure is on, on women, because women do not have any rights. And I remember from the age of uh, seven, they, uh, when you attend the school, they forced us to have hijab, compulsory hijab, mm -hmm. and to obey Islamic rules. And Mariam shared to attend uh, uh, in, in demonstrations and to force us to say debt to America, debt to Israel, and uh, follow the Islamic rules. And um, all these years uh, when we were living in Iran, we were living under so much stress because as a woman, even walking in the streets was so stressful because, uh, because of the compulsory hijab and they would arrest women in the streets just because, uh, because of showing a little of your hair, not having a proper hijab, right. having nail polish, wearing boots, wearing um, beautiful sunglasses. For different kinds of reason, you, you have to expect them to arrest them, to attack you. And that's why living uh, in Iran for women, especially for women, is much uh, more difficult. And we experienced all these things uh, when we were living in Iran. So I can't imagine growing up in a place where just a few years prior, memories that your parents have of the freedoms, the beauty of, of the Persian cultures. I mean, it's always been very fascinating for me personally. I, I hope to go to Iran someday and get to eat the food and, and see the beauty of the land. Um, and then have your experience be completely different from your parents' reality. And it's a lockdown society. It's a very oppressed society, especially for women. So tell me, how do you, how do you think in that? If, if Islam is being forced and you're being forced to read the Quran in a different language, how did you come to hear about Jesus Christ? How did you hear about the gospel? How did you come to be Christians? Yeah, as I mentioned, uh, you know, um, since our childhood, they forced us to follow the Islamic rules, and we didn't have access to any other religions. And um, the only thing that we had were Quran and Islamic books. They forced us to follow uh, those rules. And uh, but from my childhood, I always uh, were curious about the truth about. Uh, having relationship with God, I was thinking how I can have a relationship with did God. Your, did your parents, um, were they aware of Christianity? No, were they... nobody. And it's very interesting. I, I, I'm, you know, I can say majority of Iranian, they just born as a Muslim. Okay. They do not practice Islam. My family were li like that. We, we believe we all were just mo um, Muslim because we just born in Iran. Because you don't have any option to choose another religion. When sure. you're born in Iran, you have to be a Muslim and you have to feel any documents you have to take that you are a Muslim. But I never considered my, myself a Muslim because I was searching and I wanted to mm. find the truth. And from my childhood, I was so curious about the truth, about having relationship with God. 
I had a very good relationship with my dad and we love each other so much. And I always compare my relationship, um, you know, with uh, my dad, uh, with my relationship with God. And I was thinking um, the way that Islam teaches us about uh, God, it's, um, it's not correct because they, they would teach us that um, God is like a big king that is so far from you and you right. can't have a close relationship with, uh, with him. And as soon as you do a sin, he will uh, punish you. And very bad punishments. They would describe those kind of punishments so to us. Yeah, to yeah. make fear for us. And I, I always was thinking, okay, this my earthly father loved me so much. Yeah. So how it's possible the God who created me, he should be more close to me. He should love me more than um, my family members, more than my father. So how it's it's possible that he should be such a cruel uh, God? And they would force us to pray namaz. In Islam, we have to pray namaz five times a day and just bending in front of God, repeating Arabic words. And I was thinking, uh, so... Oh, this is wrong. If I talk to my God in Farsi, he wouldn't hear me. Why I have to bend in front of him just a specific times. If I talk to him another time, he wouldn't hear me. Mm. He wouldn't answer me. I had all these questions in my mind and the answer I was getting at school because I was a kind of students would ask a lot of questions <laughs> in my theology sure, classes. Yeah. And that would make Make, make make them angry about me and they would tell me no you should just obey the rules if you want to know God you have to obey these rules that's why I didn't have any option and I decided okay if that makes me connected to God so let's do that and I started you know praying namaz and reading Qurans for two years non-stop we did that but nothing happened it was just practicing uh, rules and after a while I became so tired just practicing these rules and um, I stopped doing that and after that uh, I had a dream I, that uh, for the first time God spoke to me through my dream and in that dream, I was praying to the sky. Suddenly, the sky opened, and a white horse came down and started talking to me. He told me, sit on my back. When I obeyed, he took me to a city where people coming out of a mosque, they were practicing Islamic rules, which is very famous among Muslims in Iran. And at the beginning, they couldn't see me, but suddenly God revealed their real faces to me. They changed to savage animals. As soon as I saw them, they could see me on top of the horse and they attack me to take me off from the horse. So the horse started running to save me uh, from those people. And I remember uh, while he was running, I held its neck uh, so tight and I felt its love pouring to me wow. with a power and purity. I had never experienced such a love in my entire life. And uh, that was so amazing. When I awoke, um, I couldn't believe uh, that I tasted the love of God in that dream. Uh, and I couldn't describe it to anybody. That, that love make me, made me crazy because I wanted to die and taste that love again. Yeah. It was the love of God. And uh, I believe in that dream, God revealed the real face off to me first. And also he let me to taste his love through that white horse. And after that uh, dream, I decided just to have my personal relationship with God, just talking to him. Uh, in Farsi, instead of just l repeating Arabic words, which is not my language. Right. And uh, I started doing that. And after that, one of my friends talked to me uh, about Jesus for the first time. Before that, I didn't know about Jesus. And it's very interesting. Uh, from my childhood, I always loved cross. Everybody in my family knew that. My brothers, uh, whenever they wanted to give me a gift, they would buy a cross for me. And I didn't know why I loved that. And later when I uh, know, know Jesus, Jesus, I found that why I had this, you know, interest about uh, cross, even though I didn't know the meaning behind the cross. And uh, for the first time, uh, one of my friend talked to me about Jesus, and she told me Jesus is the Son of God who has come to this earth to free us from our sins. And uh, after that, by hearing that, you know, I became curious, and I received the Bible. I started reading the Bible. 
uh, but still I had questions about uh, Bible and uh, I wasn't sure. That's why one day I did a simple prayer and I just asked God, if Jesus is the truth, you must um, guide me to the right path because I don't know what is the truth in this world. There are a lot of religions mm -hmm. and I don't know which one is the truth. If Jesus is the truth, you must guide me to the right path and save me uh, from being misguided. Uh, so uh, after that, miracles started happening in, into my life and uh, I had other dreams about Jesus and I had the experience of healing for the first time that I attend in church. Uh, also, um, I want to make it brief because it's a long yeah. story. But so, my, so you went to a church right after all this? Yes, it was um, at that time when I converted to Christianity, there was only one building church in Iran. Really? That people from Muslim background uh, could attend in that church and listen to the sermons. It would run by Armenians and they okay. would speak in Farsi. That's why people could hear, you know, wow. the sermons. And this was permitted by the government. Uh, it wasn't permitted. But, but they just did it. Um, but um, we have to be careful because we knew that the government uh, monitored the church. And okay. um, we had to go there just once a month to be careful not to go every uh, week because um, they checked the people who is coming. And they, they, they knew that this church should be for Armenians and Assyrian. They, they wouldn't allow Muslim people attending the church. But I... I was lucky I had the um, uh, experience of attending in that church and uh, a few times. Even though you're not Armenian or Assyrian? Yes. So you'd have to sneak in. Yeah. So and to clarify, this is fascinating because uh, I spent time in Iraq recently working on a project and I'm starting to make sense of who the Assyrians are. We'd yeah. read about them in the Old Testament and to know that they're like the Kurds. Mm -hmm. They're people who, uh, they, they're a people group um, without a nation. And mm -hmm. so those people in Iran are permitted to go to a church and you would have to sneak into it. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, uh, actually, just as I mentioned, only Armenian and Assyrian okay. can attend the church. Yeah. And just Muslim um, people uh, could not attend regularly. Okay. And they have to be careful. And I had this you know, chance to attend for the first time in a church, in a building church. And that was so amazing, the experience that I had. I could see people were worshiping God in joy. They were worship, talking to him in their own language yeah. instead of just repeating another um, language. And that was amazing. And I had the experience of healing in the church. Uh, but still, you know, I, I began to believe in Jesus because of all my dreams and uh, the experience of healing. But still, I had some uh, doubts about some parts of Bible, about Holy Spirit. I couldn't understand it. And that's why I asked God to, um, to give me, to show himself to me, to prove it. Because I told him, I don't want to have any doubts about Jesus. And I remember one day I was, I was alone at my room and I was praying to God. And suddenly I received the flames of Holy Spirit. It was so powerful. And I started praying in tongues, the languages that I never know. And uh, that was so amazing. And I, it was the first time that I could, you know, ha have a relationship with God. I could touch him. Yeah. And while I was crying, I saw Jesus for a few seconds in front of me. He was uh, wearing a white clothes and beside him there was a big throne uh, which was covering with shining gold, uh, with jewels. And that was amazing. He was standing be um, beside that uh, throne and smiling at me. And I felt that during that time, I felt that God had removed the curtain before my eyes. And wow. I, I didn't have any doubts at that time about Jesus. And uh, my eyes were, were open. And I kept uh, worshiping God and singing for him. And it took about four or five hours because it started <laughs> at 11 at night until wow. four or five in the morning. And I couldn't control it. I couldn't stop it because... My jaw was in pain, but I was enjoying this relationship because it was like uh, lovemaking <clears throat> with God. And that was so amazing wow. experience that I had. And after that, you know, I gave all my heart to Jesus and I, 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 I was in love with him because yeah. I first I experienced uh, his love. And yeah. after that, you know, I was in love with him. And I shared this message with my family members, with other people. 
And I How did they take it? What did they say? Praise God, yeah. My, it took a time for each of them, okay. um, but praise God, each one of them have different stories that how Jesus met him. I am so uh, grateful that uh, my family members are Christians too. Wow. Wow. I mean, so much to unpack. Thank you for sharing that. In the West here, it, that, 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 what you just shared is very rare. Uh, you know, we read about those experiences in the Bible. We, we trust the Bible, but we go, oh, I don't know if that's for today. Yeah. And then theologies differ on their approach. But the beautiful thing about it is that, that God is moving in Iran in an incredible way. And yeah. even if missionaries can't make it and churches can't form, God's going to reveal himself. And I'm so... God Just has different awe. ways he to does, reveal himself yeah, to yeah. people, and no one can stop him. The first yeah. time I met, um, I met some friends in, uh, they had been driven away from their homes from Mosul, uh, Iraq, and, uh, and they were living in a, um, an IDP camp, an internally displaced people camp. And uh, I'll, I'll never forget when they mm-hmm. shared the story, like, yeah, like Jesus came to me in my dream. And I thought, oh my goodness, I've always heard these stories. And to, to, to understand that this is very normative in places where, you know, the governments have prohibited the gospel or Bibles or the church and um, just, just incredible. I want to know how you two met. How did you guys become best friends and ministry partners? Uh, how did you guys connect? Um, Before answering that question, I would like to share uh, something about the church you asked, about Armenian and Assyrian church in Iran. You know, they were risking their own lives too. The pastors who were running the church at that time, I don't know if you heard about Pastor Haik or Pastor Dibaj. Pastor Haik was an Armenian pastor. He was a uh, bishop at the time. And he was uh, the head of uh, that church uh, that Marzia mentioned. And at that time, they were risking their lives by uh, allowing Muslims to attend uh, oh in, a, in a building church. Uh, I remember when I was attending the church, um, I could see that the pastors were called to, um, to um, intelligence officers, and they were asked to give names of wow. Muslims who were attending the church. And they, if they refused, they would keep them in solitary cells. They would interrogate them. They were under so much pressure. And... Um, about 20 years ago, because of this, Pastor Haig uh, was murdered by the intelligence officers. Actually, there were, there were two pastors, Pastor Dibaj, who was a Muslim converted to Christianity in the same church. Uh, he was in prison, and Pastor Haig, who was an Armenian and head of that church, advocated for his release. And the government had to release both of, both of them from prison. But later, they stopped both of them in the streets um, because of, you know, evangelizing to Muslims. Sure, sure. Uh, for, for Armenian and Assyrians, it was legal uh, to attend church and to participate in church services. But as soon as the government realized that they were evangelizing Muslims and, in, and accepting them to church, it was a big trouble for them. And it's the same today. Uh, even Armenian and Assyrians are not safe. You can't say that they are safe. They can't have their Christian activities. Both groups, Muslims um, and also um, Armenian and Assyrians, are experiencing persecution in Iran. Wow! Thank you for sharing and yeah, clarifying that. Yeah, I just wanted that. to yeah. mention that. Did you know? It, it, in, were were they the pastors when, when no, you were there, we, or that we, before your time? They were. Uh, they were. Unfortunately, they were um, murdered years ago before I became Christian okay. and I started attending in the church. By, uh, but I remember the first few years that I became Christian, I used to listen to Pastor Hike's sermon, and it was really a blessing to me. How did you listen to it? Uh, it was on DVD and CDs oh, available in the church, okay. and they would give them out, and they were speaking in Farsi, and it was a huge blessing, wow. you know. Yeah. They had a big role in, uh, you know, evangelizing Muslims from, you know, to, to understand Christianity, because, um, you know, people in Iran do not have access to Bible, right. and there's no way for them to learn about Christianity, so they were risking their lives to spread the message among people from Muslim backgrounds. Well, they didn't have access to Bibles until you came along. <laughs> yes. Let's jump to that part of the story. So you guys connect, um, become friends, and then your ministry to uh, to pass out Bibles in a country where it's highly illegal, and you have this understanding of pastors who have been murdered and imprisoned uh, just right before you, and without fear. <laughs> Uh, it's just incredible. You guys are my heroes. Um, so please tell us how, how you guys met and, and started 
praying together. And we met each other um, in Turkey for the first time in 2005. Oh. Uh, we became Christians at, the, at different times. At that time, we didn't know each other. Uh, but years later, after we converted to Christianity, um, I was introduced to a Christian organization by pastors of Assembly of God Church uh, because they knew that I had this passion to evangelize Iranian. I would evangelize yeah. strangers in the street, invite them to church. And I was um, having some students who were converting from Islam to Christianity in the church, working with them to learn more about Christianity. That's why they knew my passion for God, and they knew that I wanted to spread this message to, to, to people in Iran. That's why they it was impossible to, in Iran to study more about Christianity, to learn about um, Christianity and, and pass the theology classes. Mm -hmm. That's why they introduced me to that Christian organization and uh, Marzi's pastor in a different way introduced her to that, the same organization. And we both went to Turkey in 2005 for um, studying theology and leadership courses. Oh, at a Bible college or it a conference? It was like a seminary. Seminary, okay. yeah. Seminary. Wow, yeah, awesome. it was in Turkey. Um, and Turkey is a good place for um, Christian organizations to yeah. have these uh, seminaries because um, people in Iran do not need to get visas for going to Turkey. It oh, was easy for okay. us to travel. At first, we were supposed to travel, travel to London, but that didn't happen. So we went to Turkey. It was God's plan. Um, in Turkey, we met, and after going, to, uh, after finishing our theology and leadership classes, we decided to return to Iran because we both had this passion to share this message with Iranians yeah. because we knew that they don't have access to Bible, and they are so thirsty to learn about Christianity. Yeah. Uh, because we believe that you know one thing that this Islamic regime did was uh, to show people the true face of Islam because. It's now over 40 years that the Islamic regime is ruling over people. Mm -hmm. And because of their actions um, and their, the cruelty of this regime, now people in Iran um, can see the true face of Islam. And they are tired of um, Islamic rules, especially women. And that's why they are very open and they are ready to, to hear the message of salvation, to hear about Christianity. And that's why we decided to return and... You know, we didn't know how to start serving the Lord in Iran for a few months. We were just praying, sitting at um, our apartment and just praying and asking God to show us how we can serve the Iranian people because we didn't have a Bible. We had nothing. And we prayed and we realized that God, uh, it was God's plan to start distributing Bibles among Iranian people. Uh, God spoke to us separately through verses in the Bible, through dreams that we had. And he showed us that uh, the first step is to give the message, give the Bible to the Iranian people uh, so they have access to the message. That's why we spoke with, the, with our pastor um, at the time they were in London. And they provided all these, those New Testaments for us. Um, they had to smuggle them. They couldn't send them legally. And they could send thousands of New Testaments in different portions to Iran. And we would receive them from someone else. Uh, and then we started distributing those Bibles. Um, we had different missions. Um, our big mission was during the night. Um, we, uh, when we received the thousands of Bibles, we first we bought a map of Tehran. We put it on the wall, and we started from north part of Tehran to the south. And we would pick one area and circle that area, and then we would put about 140 New Testaments in our backpack and would go to that area and just start walking and put the New Testaments in people's mailboxes. <laughs> Sometimes it would take hours to finish one area. Sometimes we had to go back to that area several times because it was a larger area to distribute those New Testaments and put them in people's mailboxes. And we did that during the night so nobody could see us. But um, beside that, we also had um, another mission during the day. We had um, a few New Testaments in our back purses and we would hand them to people and we would start a conversation, talk to them about Christianity. And, you know, everyone was so open. They were ready to hear the yeah. message of salvation and they were, some of them would tell us, you know, it was years that I was looking for a Bible. It was, I had a dream about Jesus and now you're giving me the Bible. We could see that God was preparing people's hearts even before we approached them and talked to them about Christianity. And praise God, after um, two, two and a, two or two and a half years, we could distribute 20,000 New Testaments in Tehran and in some other cities close to Tehran. 20,000. That's amazing. Okay, I, I'm immediately, I mean, again, so much to ask, so many questions. Um, to get 
Bibles into Iran must have been a logistical miracle, I'd say, one. So how did you, how did that process, if you can explain it without putting people in danger, how did you get that many Bibles into your apartment? We would carry them with our, one of our friends. There was another person who would receive the Bibles from the person who was, who was bringing them into Tehran or Iran. Okay. And we would go to our friend and just take the Bibles from him. Okay. He would help us but with the van. But how would he get like, them? But oh, we but wouldn't he would take, drive them in. Yes, yes. We, okay. He, he would there drive were them in. There some connections. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It, we don't know names, honestly. We don't sure. know the names of yeah. those people who were, who were bringing uh, Risking Bibles their lives. inside. Yeah. But we just had one connection in Iran um, that we would take the Bibles from him. Okay. It was in his basement. We would just take like 1,000 or 2,000 at a time. Um, I remember once we were sitting in a van, the three of us, with thousands of Bible in the van, and we were taking them to our apartment. And so it was at night. We decided to do it at night because we didn't want to risk anything. And suddenly we realized that um, in the way back home, um, the police um, was stopping cars and searching cars. And we, were, we couldn't do anything. We were already in the traffic. There were two cars in front of us, two cars behind us, and we were there. We had to be in the line. And we were so scared and we were shocked. We didn't know what to do. We couldn't even speak to each other. And we just started praying, all three of us. And suddenly a fight happened between a driver and police officers and they let other cars to pass. And it was just God's <laughs> miracle. You know, if they arrested yeah. us with, with all those Bibles, they would have executed us. Yeah. One of my heroes is Brother Andrew. Do you know Brother Andrew? We have you heard, heard, about heard about him? Yeah. He, uh, in fact, he, the God smuggler. Yeah. And he was, uh, you know, he just started by loading up his Volkswagen and driving it uh, into Eastern Europe uh, past the Iron Curtain. And um, yeah, it was just, he has so many stories like that. And I just remember reading them and just going, oh man, I hope I get to do that someday. Well, I, I got to smuggle a few Bibles into Cuba um, but I don't think it was as dangerous, but I, I, I want it to be, yeah. <laughs> there's like a little fantasy I have of just, you know, breaking the law to, to, to smuggle in Bibles. Um, I just, wow, that's, that's so incredible. Um, so you were doing this for two and a half years, distributing 20,000, um, Bibles. And during that time, um, how were you guys in fellowship? Were, were you, your apartment, was it a church as well? Were you guys having Bible studies? Were you guys, how, what was that like? Yes, we have two house churches. Um, uh, we started two house churches. One of them uh, we decided to do for um, young generation because um, as Mariam shared, when we were talking to youth about Jesus, they were so interested to hear more about Jesus. That's why we started that uh, house church for young people, and we would invite them whenever we were talking to people and about Jesus, we would invite them to our church. And the other house church that we had, we started for prostitutes. Um, you know, in prostitution in Iran is uh, totally different from other countries. In other countries, um, there is a specific areas that you can go and... Like a um, red light district. Yeah, or... and uh, prostitutes usually live um, in those areas, and you uh, recognize them by looking at their faces. But in Iran, it's very difficult because usually uh, widows uh, do prostitution. Uh, actually, they don't call it prostitution. Uh, they call it temporary marriage. Uh, and it's based... Temp temporary marriage? Yeah. Okay. In Farsi, they call it sire. Uh, based on Islamic rules, um, women uh, can have temporary marriage. For, for instance, for a year, they can have contract and to marry for a year, for a month, uh, for a month or for a week, or even for a couple of hours. Oh, it's a kind okay. of, you know, prostitution, but uh, the Islamic regime um, encourage women to have such a marriage. It's, it's based on Quran because the Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, had four legal wives and many temporary marriages. That's why they are saying and teaching people that it's, uh, legal as as long as you have the contract, it's okay because they do mullahs do the contract for women uh, for people and receive money. But if you do prostitution out of that contract, they call it this is prostitution, and they would arrest you know women who do not have that contract. 
But this is a kind of prostitution too. Uh, such a marriage is that to have, you know, uh, to marry for a couple of hours. Sure. And that's why we felt that we need to have a church among those women who are doing uh, that. And it was very difficult to find them. Uh, and we knew two of them and we started the house, uh, house church with them and it was very difficult to convince them that w what they were doing it's it's prostitution and they would tell us no it's we have the legal paper we uh, we did mm -hmm. the marriage and we were ex trying to explain to them and teach them that this is a lie this is not marriage and it's um it's prostitution and, and they were unaware of their oppression no and um Praise God, you know, we started with two women, and at the end, uh, when we got arrested, um, our house church, there were 40 women that were attending in the house church, and we tried to um, teach them uh, about Christianity, about Jesus, the love of God, and um, one of the, their problem was that they they told us, they shared with us that um, what they can do, because uh, they didn't have a husband, and uh, they told us that how we can support our children because uh, we can't have a job, we can't get a job, and uh, they didn't know any skills. As I mentioned, in Iran, women do not have rights, equal rights with men. Uh, there is no more jobs for women, and it's very difficult for a single uh, woman to support herself. That's why they were doing that. They were um, signing the contracts with different men to in order to receive support from uh, those men. And uh, yeah, and we had these um, uh, two house, church, uh, house churches. And uh, as Mariam mentioned, we were also talking to people every day, evangelizing Iranian people. And it was in 2009 that um, because of you know these activities, uh, the government arrested us. Uh, praise God, they didn't know about our big mission. Uh, Mariam shared that, uh, that we were distributing Bibles uh, during the nights. Uh, if they had known, they would have executed us immediately. But praise God, God really protected us when uh, we got arrested. And who, I, who was arrested first? Were you arrested at the same time? Or? No, it was me. Uh, actually, they called me uh, in the morning. Somebody called me from the police station and told me, there is problem with your car documents. And I was suspicious about uh, the call and um, because I was thinking, so what's wrong with the documents? And he told me, you need, you need to come to the police station. I will explain to you. And I, I, we both felt there is something wrong here. Yeah. And, uh, but since we were distributing Bibles after finishing uh, Tehran, the capital of Iran, we were taking Bibles to other cities. That's why I w we were thinking, so it's better to go to see if there is any problem with car because if they, the police stop us in the road, it would be, it would... They would uh, search you Yeah, sure. they would search <clears throat> the car and it would cause more problem. That's why I decided to go to the police station. And I, when I went there, uh, they told me that this is not about your car. And we ask you, we lie to you to bring you here. Uh, it's about um, your faith. Are you a Christian? And I, I immediately I told him, um, yes, I am a Christian. Is there any problem? And I was thinking about another thing, too, because a few days before we got arrested, I went to renew my passport. And uh, when they give the documents to you, there's a section that you need to check that you are a Muslim. But I didn't check. I checked that I am a Christian. And the lady that uh, who saw my documents, she told me she look at my documents, she look at my name because my my family names is Islamic name, and she looked at them and told me, so how it's possible, um, your your mom and your father's name are Islamic names, so how it's possible that you are a Christian, and I just told her sometimes it's possible, everything is possible. And she got com a little confused and forget about, you know, asking more questions because she was busy. Right. I was thinking maybe that caused the problem because I, when I went uh, home after uh, that, I told Mariam that I did that. I checked uh, Christianity and she was a little suspicious. I was thinking maybe they reported to the police station. But uh, when I went to the police station, he told me, 
uh, our guards uh, saw you and uh, your friend that you were um, giving people Bible in the streets, talking to them. And again, I told him, so what's wrong? This is my faith, and I, I, I have the right to share my faith with other people. And he got so mad, and he told me, I will tell you what is wrong. And immediately he told, asked a guard to handcuff me, and then he took my phone, and he told me, uh, we are going to go uh, take you to your apartment to arrest your friend too. And I told him, you don't have any search warrant, so how you want to come to my home? And he said, we don't need that. And wow. in, in, in those cases, um, we just call the court and it's immediate. Um, we get immediate searching. And um, they took me to the home and they arrested Mariam and they took us, took both of us to the police station. And they put us in a very dark and dirty cell uh, full of trash. And it was uh, during the winter, it was so cold. And they threatened us and they told us, uh, we will interrogate both of you, and you have to give all. Um, you have to um, tell the truth, and uh, otherwise we will beat you until you vomit blood. And I told him, um, sir, from the beginning um, you told told me lie, and uh, but I from the first time that I came here, you asked me you are Christian. I told you the truth. Now you are telling me you should tell the truth. We, we don't have anything to hide from you. And they sent us to the cell and they told us, um, we will come back and take you for interrogation and uh, we will torture you. And we were so scared at that time and we started uh, praying uh, and asking God to strengthen us. And um, I, I, I had dreams before um, we got arrested a few years before we go to prison. God told me that one day you will pass through prison experience. I, hmm. I was aware of that, but uh, I didn't know about the details, what is going to happen inside prison. That's why, you know, we had, um, I had my own fear and uh, we both were so scared. We were pale and uh, we just started praying and asking Holy Spirit to strengthen us. Mm -hmm. And praise God, at that night, um, they didn't came to took us for interrogation. We don't know what happened. But late at night, they transferred us to uh, another place, uh, which was a detention. It called uh, Vozaro det Detention, which was a horrible place. Okay, so is that part of Evan Prison? No, it's, uh, it's a jail. It's oh, different. Oh, okay, yeah. it's different. Okay. So, and your charge here was apostasy. It was uh, conversion to Christianity. That's why you were in prison. At this time, we were not charged with anything. Um, this was just a, the, um, you know, this just the beginning of the process of their interrogations. It was we we had to go back to the police station for interrogations. They would interrogate us separately for hours. I remember wow. the first night we were arrested. They uh, interrogated the, the same person who um, was Marzi was talking about, interrogated her and also interrogated me for, I remember, two or two and a half hours. And uh, it, was, it was interesting that he was asking questions um, and he was, he had, he was, he was writing question, um, questions with red color and he was, I was telling him the answers and he was writing down my answers. And he had like 10 papers. At the end, he asked me to sign the papers and I said, but you were writing the answers. Uh, how do I know what you wrote um, as my answers? And he said, I'm, I'm a man of God. I believe in God. I, I will never write anything that is not true in these papers. And he forced me to sign the papers. Later, I realized that he wrote whatever he wanted hmm. for those answers um, in, during the interrogations we had in a, in a different place. But um, at that time, you know, we were just um, going to the police station for interrogation and the detention center that Marzia mentioned, it was called Vozaro Detention. Uh, they usually don't transfer political or religious prisoners to that detention because it's a horrible place. It's, mm. It was in the basement. It was like a dungeon. Uh, you couldn't see the light. Um, we, had, we had no access to food or drinking water for, a few, for the first few days. And there were prostitutes, addicted, homeless girls in that detention. There was no carpet, no bed. We had to sleep on concrete floor. Uh, it was freezing. It was in the middle of winter. And there was no blanket. There, were, there was only some wet blankets, strongly smelling of urine. And they told us, these are only the blankets you can use. We had to use mm. them because we sure. had to cover ourselves to keep ourselves warm. Ugh. And I remember the first night we entered the, into that detention center, 
we could see um, some open eyes. They were staring at us in that darkness. There were other women in that in those cells, and we could just we couldn't believe. You know, it was like a dream. Um, the first day and the first night, it was so shocking. We couldn't believe where we were, and it was so much pressure. We were so scared and. Uh, I remember for the first few days, we were just praying for our release. We didn't want to be in that condition. But later, God changed that you know, environment, and he showed us that he had a purpose for sending us to that place because we realized we had great opportunities to share the message with those women who were in that detention. Um, we mentioned you know, we had house churches for prostitutes in the past in our own apartment. But um, you know, it was hard to find those prostitutes and you know, just to share the message with them. But in that detention, every day they would bring prostitutes and um, their bosses, you know, those people who would hire prostitutes. And we had, they were coming to us. We didn't have to go look for them. And we had this opportunity to share the message with them, um, to listen to their stories. You know, they had so many sad stories. Um, how, and we realized how the Islamic regime you know, destroyed the lives of most of those women. Mm. Um, and they were all victims, we believe. Uh, they were victims of this government, these Islamic rules. Because in Islam, they don't value women. Women do not have any rights. And most of them, when we heard their stories, uh, sometimes we had nothing to say. We, ha we were just silent. We couldn't say anything because their pain, it was so hard to just hear the mm -hmm. pains they've been through and uh, you know how the, the, guard, the, the, the regime destroyed their lives. That's why we believe it was a great opportunity for us to be in that place and to pray for them. It was like having a house church in that detention. Yeah. We could gather with all those women, we could share the message, and after a while we could see that they started praying. They would ask God to forgive them and they would invite Jesus to their hearts I believe for the first 14 days we were in that detention center, we could share the message with about 70 to 80 women in that detention. But it was after we were transferred from that detention to Evin prison that um, they charged us with apostasy, blasphemy, okay. anti-government, and promoting Christianity. So one of my favorite stories uh, in the Bible, um, it reminds me of this is Acts chapter 16 when Paul and Silas are imprisoned and uh, they're in this horrible reality, horrible situation as you guys know, and uh, they're worshiping God. They're singing songs and praying out loud. And when this massive earthquake comes through and every all the prisoners are free to yeah. leave, they choose the freedom that Paul and Silas have. And, and uh, so it's, it's interesting how your mission field where you used to have to go to it, it's now coming to you. And um, I, I can't imagine what that was like. It must have been um, encouraging in those dark days to have new people to talk to and new people to share the hope of Jesus with. Did you, did you see people respond to your sharing the gospel in prison where people... Yes, many people. Um, after, you know, the detention Mariam shared, they transferred us to Evin Prison, which is very notorious, notorious for arresting, yeah. torturing, raping, and executing of many innocent people. And, you know, we had a difficult times in uh, prison because we were both sick. We were suffering uh, from physical health. Uh, we didn't have access to doctors. Unfortunately, in Evin Prison, there were... There was a small clinic, and uh, they would uh, send uh, sick people to that clinic. Um, but for us, it was different. Uh, I believe uh, in Evin prison, we were in another prison because uh, prisoners could have access to you know, clinic, to um, some uh, classes um, that they could learn something, to do something. But we didn't have that uh, because um, once, uh, as soon as they would transfer us to a clinic, uh, the, the first uh, question was that what is your charge and as soon as they would hear that we were Christians they would refuse to give us medication and also the first time I remember uh, when I went to the uh, place that there were classes I wanted to see what they do uh, what prisoners do what they learn and I wanted to make myself you know busy in that place uh, as soon as the manager saw me um, he uh, she asked me what is uh, why you are here what is your name and then she asked me, what is your charge? And as soon as I told her that I am a Christian, uh, I'm here because of my faith, he, she shouted at me and she told me, who let you 
uh, let you in here. You should be ex executed immediately. You are dirty and uh, you are brainwashing mm. people. Um, you are not allowed to come to this um, uh, place. And um, her behavior was so uh, bad. She ins insulted me. It broke my heart mm -hmm. so bad. And um, at that time, I told her, uh, Ma'am, uh, I didn't do anything wrong. I'm so proud that I'm here because of the name of Jesus. And um, then I left her office and I came back to the cell because they didn't allow me to, um, to be there. And um, that's why we were... Uh, in another prison, inside prison, um, all prisoners could go different places, but we were just isolated uh, in the room. And as I mentioned, physically, uh, we were under so much pressure. They wouldn't give us medications. We were suffering. But as Mariam shared, we had great opportunities to share the message of salvation with many prisoners. We tried to show them who Jesus is, what his teachings are, by our behaviors, by uh, respecting them, by loving them, by praying for them. Because there were some prisoners who were uh, prejudiced Muslims. And in Islam, they believe that if you convert from Islam to any other religion, you are infidel and dirty. And I remember for the first few months, they called us dirty Christians. Hmm. Uh, but after you know the miracles started happening among prisoners, we shared a lot of stories in our book, Captive in Iran about uh, God's work among prisoners, his miracles. And I had dreams about prisoners and uh, God uh, worked through my dreams and uh, it would happen and miracles would happen. And after that, the God really changed the prison for us. Um, those people who were insulting us, they came to us, they apologized because of their behavior. And they told us, uh, it's very interesting that uh, we can see there is a difference between your faith and our faith because every day we are practicing these Islamic rules, we are praying namaz, but nothing happened. But we can see as soon as you pray for a prisoner, as soon as you have a dream, um, the miracle happens. And that was so, so amazing to them. And that's why they came to us. They started asking questions about Jesus. It was interesting. We never went to a prisoner to talk about you know, Jesus. They came to us. Um, every day they would come to us and ask questions about Jesus. And um, you know, the guards find out about it because they could um, hear from prisoners that miracles are happening. They became curious. They also came to us and started asking questions. Some of them were so mad. I remember um, one of my interrogator told me, he was so mad and he shouted at me and told me that I heard that even in prison, you are talking to prisoners about Jesus, you should shut your mouth here, not talk about Jesus. This is not the place. You are brainwashing uh, people. And I told him, I'm so sorry. This is not our fault. This is your fault because you arrested us. You put us in this prison. Prisoners are curious. They ask us why you are here. What is your charge? So we have to explain to them why we are here. So you can see this is not our fault. You put us here. And they were so desperate because they couldn't do anything else. Uh, we already were in prison <laughs> yeah, and they couldn't do anything. And I remember some of you know our friends also would come to us and they told us, um, we think you are two crazy people because you, by, you can just deny your faith and be free. And uh, I remember I had an um, interesting conversation with one of the prisoners. She sentenced to life and uh, she told me, one day she told me, Marzi, I think you and your friend are crazy. You do not appreciate your freedom. You can just deny your faith and be free. Why you want to be, why you are insisting on your faith? And I tried to explain to her that um, this is, you know, um, our faith. And I told her that I feel we are more free inside the prison because they can't, uh, they arrested us, they arrested our, they kept us, you know, physically in prison, but in our spirit, we are not, uh, you know, captive, we are free. And uh, she couldn't understand that, you know, we tried to explain to prisoners and uh, they would laugh at us that, uh, you know, by denying your faith, you can be free because they told us in the court, uh, one of the judges told us, if you um, deny your faith, we, we would release you. But uh, we didn't do that because we 
as I shared my, you know, um, testimony, um, and both of us separately experienced Jesus. We were in love with Jesus, mm -hmm. and um, we couldn't deny our faith. We have a lot of experience. We saw many miracles, and uh, Jesus in Bible uh, says that if you want to follow me, you have to uh, take your cross and follow me every day. Mm -hmm. And we consider that as a, you know, uh, honor for us to be in prison, to suffer for, um, for our faith. I remember once I had a dream um, and God showed me in my dream, I was suffering physically so bad. And in my dream, uh, I was looking at my hands and suddenly I saw a big hole in my right hand. And I was looking at my hand. I remember the hands of Jesus who um, crucified on cross. And God told me, I let you to taste a little of my suffering. Mm. And I was crying in that dream. And when I awoke, my face was full of my tears. I was crying and I was thinking how I was lucky and how I was honored to taste a little of the suffering that Jesus suffered for us. And I believe the suffering that we experience um, in prison compared to the sufferings that Jesus did for us, it's nothing. Mm. That's why, you know, uh, we couldn't deny our faith. And I remember the day that we got released, those uh, prisoners who told us that you are crazy, uh, when they uh, knew more about Jesus, about our faith, they told us that um, we we so proud of you, that we never saw people that... Um, you know, to stand on their faith and to, because they, they sentenced us to execution by hanging. They told us, if you want to insist on your faith, we will execute you. Wow. So contrary to our culture, um, one of comfort, one of um, abundance, and to, to choose uh, that suffering um, and to get to taste the joy that it brings um, is, is such a gift and one that um, you both carry with you. Your stories, again, are just so powerful. Um, and I, I want to ask you what it's like to, because I, I know you're const you had to share your story in the book and um, you're constantly speaking at churches now. Um, why, why do you share your story? Why, why are you on this mission to continue to just talk about something that I think was so horrific in so many ways, but, and in the past, you're no longer in Iran. Um, so why do you, why do you share your story? You know, after um, we got released from prison, um, in the book, you know, it's, this is just part of what we experienced. This is not all the details. Um, we both had separate, you know, experiences in prison. Um, we were tortured mentally, psychologically, which was worse than physical torture in mm -hmm. prison. And we cannot even, I think there, are, there were moments that we couldn't even describe by words, you know, how we suffered inside prison. And it wasn't easy for us. When we talk about prison experience, we wrote about it. Um, it's not easy, you know, even though today after almost 10 years, we cannot even forget some of those memories. And uh, we think that last night we were sharing that with a group of people that, you know, um, prison experience um, have, have changed us forever. We are not the same people that we were before going to prison. And God allowed us to see all those injustices and go through all those difficulties for a reason, for a purpose. And I remember when we were leaving Evin prison, when we were freed um, at the end because of, you know, we believe it was first God's grace and God's um, power that allowed us uh, to be free from prison. And he gave us that victory. It was for his glory. And also there were many Christian organizations who um, started advocating for us. Christians started praying for us from all around the world. Um, some organizations, human rights organizations like the UN, Amnesty International got involved, U.S. State Department, even the Pope from Vatican sent a letter to the Iranian government. And because of all these supports from the international community, the Iranian regime had to release us. Wow. Um, you know, they didn't, they did not want to let us be free. They wanted to execute us by hanging or keep us in prison at least forever. But they couldn't do it because they saw that the, the world was watching them. And at the time we were, um, I think it was just God's plan. You know, at the time we were the only f women and the first women, I believe, who became arrested because of their Christian faith. That's why our case received a lot of international pressure. And that's why the government had to release us. 
But you know, when we were when we were told that we were free to leave the prison building, I think it was the hardest moment emotionally to leave all those women behind. Sure. You know, for nine nine months we were living with those women. Uh, we had friends who became our best friends. You know, one of our best friends, she was a Kurdish girl. She was only 27 at the time we were in prison. She became our best friend, and she was white, fighting for women, Kurdish rights. And um, unfortunately, after we got released from prison, they executed her by hanging. Mm. You know, there were people like her who became very close to us, who became our friends, and we heard their stories. We lived with them for nine months, and now we were free. We could Get, get out of prison, but it was, I think, at that moment that we promised ourselves to not to forget their stories and to be a voice for those women and um, use our freedom uh, because we felt that responsibility to use our freedom, our voice, and this platform that God is giving us, especially here in the U.S., to be a voice for them and to share not only our stories, but we also shared the stories of those women yeah. who were experiencing injustices inside Evin Prison. And we continue to do that even though we don't live in Iran now, but we hear that people are suffering under this regime mm. every day. And it's not just religious minorities. Every single person in Iran is suffering. And Iran is like a big jail for 80 million people. That's why we feel that every Iranian who live outside Iran have a responsibility. And we, we even encourage uh, Americans or other people um, to, to use their freedom to help those who do not have this freedom now and to be a voice for them and to share their stories with them. Because we believe you know, that the, the support we were receiving when we were in prison made a huge difference and uh, brought a lot of attention to our case. And that was one of the reasons we are free and we are alive today. We can do the same for others. That's amazing. So the same support you both had from the Pope and the advocacy you had from the UN and, and Amnesty International. And, and ultimately you saw how that's, you know, you've, you're living how that's changed um, your reality by being released from prison. Now you sharing your story, you're hoping will be that advocacy voice for others. And uh, wow. Uh, can I share a little something? Uh, I would like to add, you know, uh, we believe um, being in that prison, uh, the purpose of God, it wasn't just to advocate for those people. It's one of the reasons. Another reason uh, for us, I believe, is that to be here, to bring a message to American people, to Western uh, people, uh, because um, we think, you know, um, there are some people that they do not appreciate the freedom that they mm -hmm. have. And we, our main message to American people is that please do not uh, take your freedom for granted. We need to protect this freedom. We need to stand for our freedom here. We need to save this freedom. And uh, if we do not protect this freedom, at one point we may lose it. Because um, as we shared, like Iranian people, it's, it's been over 40 years that they are, ca they are captured by evil people. And they lost their freedom because they didn't appreciate the freedom that they had before the, the revolution. And some people didn't care about standing for their freedom. That's why our main message to American people is that please uh, protect this freedom, appreciate what you have, because we believe the freedom that we have in the United States, it's really a blessing and a gift from God. And each one of us have a responsibility to stand for it, to stand with our president and those people who are, um, you know, God's people and faithful people to stand with them and to support them. And it's very important. And also, we believe that, you know, um, though for those people who live in freedom, uh, it's not just, you know, living uh, in freedom and enjoying our freedom and uh, do not care about other people. We have the responsibility for our brothers and sisters who are persecuting because of their faith in mm. other countries, in other parts of the world. It's not just Iran. There are other countries that Christians are uh, killing and murdering because of their faith, because, because they are just uh, Christians. And we have this responsibility to mm. be a voice for them, to uh, help them, to support them in different ways. Such a great reminder, and you're right. It's um, being someone who's grew up in America. It, it's easy to just assume this is how it is everywhere, and um, and we're we're very guilty of not um, understanding other cultures. Um, we're very guilty of being f so fearful. We we stay away 
And uh, what I love about your story is it's a reminder that um, God is in those tough places and he's doing incredible work in those tough places. And, uh, and our freedom here is, is I, I agree, it is a gift from God. And um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. I want to ask you both, how, what was your spiritual, I would say spiritual formation or your spiritual rhythms um, while you were in your darkest days in prison? Now you were in, in prison for 259 days. Yes. Um, so what was, uh, what was your prayer life like? How did you, did you have scripture memorized or, or talk to me about that a little bit? I can share about one interesting story. Um, as you mentioned, for nine months, uh, we didn't have access to Bible. They didn't allow us to have a Bible. And um, the only thing that helped us uh, during those uh, difficult days to stand on our faith uh, was our personal relationship with Jesus. And we could remember the verses of uh, Bible. It was very interesting. A, a lesson that I learned um, was that uh, reading Bible, uh, we, when we read Bible, we should uh, learn how to live with the verses of Bible. Mm-hmm. Instead of just reading you know, the verses, we need to learn. And it was a big lesson that I learned in prison how to live with the verses of Bible. Because there were moments uh, that I could remember the verses in uh, Bible. Like, um, as I mentioned, people were insulting us. And uh, once a guard insulted me so bad, like that woman also insulted me. And I remembered uh, the verse in Bible that Jesus uh, told us that we should love our enemies and yeah. pray for those who are persecuting us. And, and count it what, as a blessing. Yeah. And I was thinking, oh my goodness, how difficult is that practicing this? Some t- I read that verse before, but yeah. God reminded me that verse, but I was thinking practicing that verse, it's very difficult. And I realized without Holy Spirit, you can't do that. Mm. And um, I remember there were times I would pray, I was so, uh, sometimes I would, um, angry, I would um, get mad, and I I always prayed and I asked God, please give your love to me. Let me show you to these people instead yeah. of my character, instead of my yeah. behavior. And um, you know, I would remember you know the sufferings of uh, you know apostles and other verses that um, the one of the verses was First Peter that. Uh, he um, said that rejoice as you suffer, uh, you know, for the name of Jesus. And um, because we, are, we were not criminal, the, the, the day that the manager insulted me, I remember that verse that um, uh, I was so happy that, okay, I'm, I'm suffering because of my faith, because of the name of Jesus. I'm not a criminal uh, in that prison. And it was, you know... Um, like one of the way that um, you know we both uh, learn is remembering those those verses and practicing those verses in prison, and I have an interesting story about Bible because we were talking to prisoners about um, Jesus, and some of them told us that we really like to see a Bible, the words of God. We never saw um, a Bible, and one day the manager in uh, my cell was cleaning uh, the room, and um, there was some trash uh, below a bed Mm -hmm. and there was a box of trash and she took that and gave it to me and told me Marzi would you throw it um, out Uh, this is full of trash and as soon as I got the box I was curious what is inside the trash I started searching and suddenly I found the treasure inside the box among the trash it was a book of Luke I was wow I, I couldn't I couldn't believe my eyes that I can see the word of God here. Yeah. And as soon as I saw that, I hid it in my pocket and I went to bed. I, I couldn't stop crying seeing the word of God in prison in <laughs> such a dark place and among trash. And as soon as I opened the first page, I saw a note from uh, Bishop Ramsey. Uh, He signed the book, and um, he was the bishop that years ago he was in prison. And I was so, you know, um, it was so interesting to me how this book came to prison. Yeah. And because in Evan prison, uh, the ward section, um, uh, ward um, uh, for men section is separated from women wards. That's why I was thinking, okay, 
bishop was in this prison and he signed this, you know, um, booklet, uh, the book of Luke and how it came to the women wards. And it was so amazing. It was a miracle that I could see that. I shared with Mariam and we both um, read it. Wow. It was like finding a treasure sure. in prison. And after that, we decided to pass it to <laughs> other prisoners. And when we shared with some of them that um, we have the word of God, they were so delighted. That's and they, amazing. They, and each one of them would um, pass the book after reading that to other prisoners. And we decided to keep it in, inside prison. I really wanted to bring it um, yeah. how to as a memory but I decided to leave it there for other prisoners who wow. heard the message of uh, salvation oh my goodness that's amazing yeah. that's incredible how do you I mean so you, you've been released now 10 years yes yes so you're out in 2010 2000 toward the end yeah. of 2009 end of okay 2000. okay no, no. Yeah. yeah yeah okay how do you? Um, how did you get out of Iran? You know, we uh, when we left Evin prison, it wasn't like we were free. We, they just told us that um, somebody told, came to prison and they said you can leave the prison, but we had another court that we had to stay in Iran for for that last court. Um, they actually wanted uh, to release us from prison and they wanted us to escape through illegal ways. They, they could imagine that, you know, as soon as we leave the Evin prison, we would escape from Iran through sure. illegal ways, go to Turkey or other countries. And it was interesting. Uh, they gave us our passport in a week after we got released because they, they expected us to leave. They, want, they didn't want trouble for themselves. Yeah. And they didn't want to say that they released us from prison, um, you know, signing um, the court papers. That's why they gave us the last court for six months after we left Evin prison. And um, they gave us this option, you know, to, to, to leave the country illegally. Yeah. But we, dis we prayed and again we decided to stay for the last court um, because we knew that God was fighting for us and yeah. he was giving us the victory at the end. And I remember the day that uh, we were supposed to go to the court uh, with our um, lawyer. We already backed our, uh, packed our um, bags and we were ready to go back to prison in case the court decided to send us back to prison. And we went to the last court, uh, but fortunately, uh, because of the international pressure, we heard that the, from the UN, um, they contacted the Iranian officials and they already gave them the instructions and they told them that they had to release us from, from prison, from, from that court. They had to free us from all our charges. Uh, when we went to the last court, there were about um, five, six judges, and the chief judge who was sitting in the middle, um, he was just, uh, he first read um, the charges. Um, there were again, um, apostasy, blasphemy, promoting Christianity in Iran, and somebody just read the charges. And then other judges wanted to, again, start asking questions, mm -hmm. but the chief judge stopped them and said, no, you can't ask any questions. He stopped them because he didn't want to cause any other trouble. He didn't want them to ask us questions, and then we respond, and then they couldn't say that, you know, we were free from all those right. charges. That's why he stopped them from asking any questions. And in the last court, um, they told, they threatened us, basically. They said, this time, next time, if we see you in this court, it won't be like this time. You can get uh, free um, uh, as easy as this time. And they, they basically threatened us. And even before going, uh, leaving Evin prison, our interrogators threatened us. And they told us that uh, we cannot guarantee your lives here. Uh, you can't uh, live your lives as Christians. You can't have any contact with your Christian friends. You cannot uh, go to a church. Um, and they told us that we are going to watch you, monitor you. You have to give us your contact information. Every time you ch change your home, you have to give us the address. And they threatened us um, um, directly. And they said that, you know, there are prejudiced Muslims out there. One day you may die in an accident. Your house may catch on fire. They were telling us that if you decide to leave Iran, live in Iran, uh, you can't be safe. You can, we are watching you. We are monitoring you. Because they did this in the past to other pastors, as I mentioned, to mm -hmm. Pastor Haik and Pastor mm -hmm. Dibaj, who um, stabbed them, you know, who got stabbed by the regime agents um, outside, of in pre outside prison. That's why, you know, after the last court, uh, when we were free from all those charges, we, we knew that it, you know, the time for serving the Lord for us, it was finished. And we couldn't do anything else in Iran because sure. they were watching us every day. We could see government agents following us every time we would leave our apartment. 
That's why we decided to leave Iran. And we knew that God had a plan. Yeah. Um, and he, wa- he wanted to use us in a different way outside Iran. And uh, we can see that these days, you know, from the day that we moved to the United States. Uh, first, from Iran, we went to Turkey through the UN. Um, we became to the US as refugees in 2011. In 2013, we could publish our book, um, Captive in Iran. Yeah. And since then, we started speaking and sharing our stories, our experiences, and also bring awareness about the condition of Christians in Iran and about the human rights violations. Mm-hmm. It is an ongoing thing that sure. is ha- happening in Iran. And we keep talking about this. And this is um, what we do for the, what ha- we have done for the past 10 years in the US. And we see that God really had a purpose. You know, He is giving us a different platform here. He's giving us um, different opportunities in the US to share the message in a different way. So that's how you're staying radical, because you're both mm-hmm. radically amazing people, and uh, I, I love that. Um, what what challenges you? What what's ahead? I know you bo- you both have uh, just finished your master's degree. Congratulations! Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. What yeah, what was, was your December. master's yeah. in from uh, Georgia Tech or? Yes, uh, we got master of um, science in international affairs from Georgia Tech. Okay. All right. How do you uh, how do you plan on using those? What what's the next journey of your life look like? You know, we we believe uh, God ha- had a plan from the beginning um, that we were in prison, um, that we came to Christ. And that's why when we moved to the United States, um, we felt we need to be educated because we already have a lot of experience about, you know, our country, about uh, seeing injustices in um, Iran, about persecuted of um, minorities. And we felt that we need to be educated as well in order to use these skills uh, for the kingdom of God yeah. to help the uh, U.S. government to uh, in their decision making regarding Iran, regarding Middle East countries. And as Mariam shared, we would like to advocate for persecuted uh, Christians and minorities and the violations of human rights. And uh, some of our Christian friends, you know, they would tell us that, you know, being a Christian, um, it's just you can uh, have a ministry, just uh, attend the church and have a ministry. But I believe, you know, I personally believe that uh, being a Christian is it doesn't mean that we need to separate our, ourselves from the world. Mm-hmm. We should get involved in That's different right. paths in politics. Uh, because as I mentioned, like um, um, our country, Iran, it's been over 40 years. It's in the hands of evil people. And people, you know, um, we don't have believer people to run mm-hmm. the country. And uh, people put the government in the hands of evil people. And um, I believe that's why I believe Christians should get involved in different paths, different, um, you know, majors in order to be a light be for the world, to change their politics, to change the history of their countries. That's why we, you know, finished our education and um, we are praying for the next, you know, step to see what is God's will, where we can get a job and um, help um, the U.S. government uh, in their decision making, in their politics regarding um, Iran and Middle Eastern countries. So a bright future and uh, an incredible story. I can't thank you enough for being on the podcast today. I know all of our viewers will be so richly encouraged and blessed as I have been. And uh, thank, you for, thank you for being willing to share your story. Um, what an what a intimate thing. And what a, I can't imagine having to relive that every time you're interviewed. And so thank you for, for taking the time. And um, I'm just thinking of my daughter uh, my, my daughter's nine years old and, uh, to have women, um, influential women, um, like, like you two in her life, uh, is so important. And, and I thank you for, uh, obviously the courage that you've had to, to proclaim the gospel in the tough places, um, and, and to actually live it out. And thank you for, uh, having vision and, and, and a future for, uh, participating in, seeing reformation take place. And uh, so again, thank you so much for being on the podcast thank today. Thank you so for much giving for us this opportunity. Us. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, I want to actually, uh, I want to talk about your book for one second, um, Captive in Iran. You can, you've, how many copies have you guys have been sold on this? We are not sure the, about the exact number, but 
it's on uh, it's both hardcover and softcover. Wonderful. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure about the exact number. Okay. Um, incredible. I know my wife just finished it. I'm up next. And uh, yeah, so. Um, and you can buy this on Amazon. You can yeah. get it. Do you have a website? Bars Do you have a ministry? Balls everywhere, yeah. Okay, wonderful. Well, thanks again, you guys. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you.